About 10 years ago, my son was born. At the time, I was living overseas in Trinidad and Tobago, and he didn't have the right to citizenship of that country, so we applied for his British passport, and it was rejected. My son had become stateless. For a brief period, this was intensely stressful as I tried to figure out what we were going to do. In the end, I was able to resolve the situation because I had connections, not because I had rights. At the same time in my country, Britain, state security institutions were imprisoning and deporting long-term law-abiding residents who were rendered stateless as a result, without rights. When media pressure forced a U-churn of these policies, the same state institutions deliberately went slow on compensation and restitution, leaving some of the victims to die penniless in exile. I want to talk to you today about fascism. It's no longer a dark chapter of 20th century history. It's back and it seems to be winning. Let's look at some examples. An unpopular government uses unconstitutional means to suspend the legislature in order to force through an ultra-nationalist political agenda. In another country, a former army captain comes to power after an explicitly racist political campaign. He institutes new laws that remove protections for indigenous minorities and celebrates a historic coup that had led to decades of military dictatorship. Elsewhere, an aggressively nationalist ruler makes himself ruler for life. He institutes a programme of mass incarcerations of an ethnic minority and also pursues unfounded territorial claims against neighbours backed up with military threats. Somewhere else again, a traditionally secular state, a violent political movement seeks to redefine citizenship as based on religion. Members of religious minorities are subjected to violent pogroms and the state turns a blind eye. Historic places of worship are bulldozed in an attempt to erase the religious minority's right to have ever been part of that country's story. And finally, an authoritarian president does everything he can to undermine faith in the outcome of an election that he's clearly lost. In a final desperate throw of the dice, he whips his supporters up into a violent frenzy and they attempt an insurrection against the country's legislature. And of course, I'm talking about the events of the 6th of January in Washington, DC. You might recognize some of the other examples. The British government suspending parliament, the fascist presidency of Bolsonaro in Brazil, the suppression of the Uyghurs in China, the ultra-nationalist Hindu movement in India. Okay, so I'm a liberal and I don't like those politics, but is it fascism? Do we need to use the F word? Is this even a useful term? If we call people fascist, do we lose the argument before it's even begun? Well, fascism doesn't actually have a single dictionary definition, but it's ultra-nationalism expressed in violent and authoritarian ways. And because fascism is nationalist, it takes a different form in every country. In the 20th century in the UK, fascists were obsessed with the history of England, Oliver Cromwell, Henry VIII. If you look in India, fascism has tried to incorporate ancient ideas of Hindu nationalism into its belief system. In America, fascists are trying to align their activities with the history of America's revolutionaries against the British colonial rule. It's always taking that national form. And the other thing about fascism is this confusion with Nazism. Nazism was fascism, but not all fascists are Nazis. So if we use that word, we're not saying that these people are behaving like Hitler, but you don't have to behave like Hitler to merit the description of fascism. Authoritarian nationalism is always a bad thing. It always brings with it oppression, arbitrary arrest and imprisonment, 
violence, denials of minorities' rights. We can't just stand around and saying, don't worry, they haven't opened any concentration camps yet, as if that means things are still okay. So why are these things happening? Well, there are lots of factors, some unrelated, but they've all come together. The traditional media has become hyper-partisan. Look at the way Fox News has covered the aftermath of the insurrection in America, constantly saying, well, we need to bring the country together. And yet Fox News has done more to put the country apart than almost any other channel. Social media concentrates people into bubbles. They're only talking to people they already agree with or people who hold similar but more extreme views than themselves. And there's a dislocation associated with globalization. Many communities seeing their traditional industries and places of work closed down. The resulting dis disaffection with democratic politics is obvious. In 2008, 40% of people in democracies were dissatisfied. By 2020, that figure is 60%. And the numbers are higher in the larger democracies, such as the USA. And finally, there's the pandemic effect of fascist politics itself. It drives fear and hostility between countries, further empowering ultranationalism. And that has led to a concomitant collapse of the global order. Nobody believes in the UN or the EU anymore. It's all about my country first, America first, Britain first, China first, might over right. In spite of that, fascists will work together across international boundaries if it's in their interests. You look at the example of Trump addressing Hindu nationalist rallies in India, or Trump's advisor Steve Bannon helping far-right parties in Europe get to power. Vladimir Putin funding, again, far-right across the world. So fascists will work together while liberals are dissipated and divided. So why does this matter? Well, you don't have to wait for Nazism, for fascism to be a problem. I proposed this talk last year, long before the events of the 6th of January, but let's see where that has led, a violent insurrection at the American Congress. And there are other effects all over the world, the destruction of the Brazil's rainforest, rising sectarian violence in India, these are all features of 21st century fascism. Fascists work together, as we've seen, if their nationalist aims coincide. But fascism stops countries from working together in the global interest. If we're going to tackle the climate emergency, fascists have to lose power. But perhaps the most important point is that fascism isn't democracy. It's not what the people want. Donald Trump lost the election by millions of votes. Boris Johnson may have a large parliamentary majority in the UK, but he got that from 43% of the vote. Rodrigo Duterte in the Philippines, an outright fascist, won his election on 39% of the vote. It's not that fascists are what the people want, it's just that fascists are better at taking and holding on to power. So what can we do? I think there are three things. We have to fight complacency. If we look at recent events, Brexit, the election of Trump, there's been many occasions when people rather lazily thought they knew what the outcome was going to be. We have to recognise that there's a problem and take action. We can't wait for things to happen. Now, if you're not happy with the F word, I don't mind that much, but we can't pretend that normal politics is in play at the moment. The second thing is, I think we need to educate ourselves. I've done some research on this. I've seen that half the world's population are currently living in countries run by ultranationalists. Let's learn about that. Let's learn about how fascists operate. They dehumanise their opponents, they make them stateless, they take away their rights. But the other thing they do is they break constitutional orders. They behave in ways that cause 
accepted methods and behaviours to disappear. Look at what happened in America. America's constitution relied on the loser of a presidential election accepting the result and conceding. The refusal to do that has created what could easily turn into a violent insurgency in that country. And let's recognise that this is a global fight. It's not enough to worry about elections in your own country alone. You've got to think about what's happening to democracy everywhere. Educate yourself about the struggles of the democratic movement in Hong Kong, for example. Look at what's going on in India. Realise that this is a global issue. Now, there are things we probably shouldn't do. Shouting you're a fascist at the supporters of ultranationalism probably isn't going to help very much. We have to strengthen the appeal of the other side. Many of the people who've been dragged into supporting these politics are people who feel that they've lost their way, they've run out of options. We've got to give them reasons to leave those politics behind. So final thoughts. I think a lot of people thought that if Joe Biden won the election in America, this would be a great setback for the politics of violence, of white nationalism, of anti-democratic forces. But what we've seen is the opposite. It's not just about the elections. It's about the norms of behaviour. The norms of political behaviour are being attacked by fascists. We have to stand firm, we have to reject that, and we have to remain vigilant.